everybody. I'm Andrea Ems, and welcome back to Voices of Calm, a holiday edition. We are going to continue on in the story of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol. But before we do, as always, allow me to introduce our cast. We have three narrators, Helen Vaughn in California, Christine Rendell in New York, Lily and Rachel in D.C., and Scrooge is played by Doug Ramsdell in New York. The ghost of Christmas past is Jesse Valinsky in California. Young adult Scrooge is Susan Iannucci in California, and Fezziwig and Belle's husband is played by Dan Delgado in New York, and Belle is played by Jennifer Jill Araya in Ohio. And now let me pass it over to Adam Barr, who is the creator of Voices of Calm and a fellow thespian, as you would please take us away. Thank you, Andrea, and greetings from Philadelphia again, everyone, and happy holidays as we continue on with Charles Dickens a Christmas Carol. And one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that this story has endured for nearly 180 years and feels new every time we come to it, is Dickens' expertise in personifying something so big and important as memory in something so diminutive as the ghost of Christmas past. And as Scrooge is about to find out, touring with the ghost around various locales from his past in 1843 Southeast England, memory can be very pleasant, or it can be more difficult, but it is always instructive. So let's continue on with Stave 2, Part 2, The First of the Three Spirits. Although they had but that moment left the school behind them, they were now in the busy thoroughfares of a city where shadowy passengers passed and repassed, where shadowy carts and coaches battled for the way, and all the strife and tumult of a real city were. It was made plain enough by the dressing of the shops that here too it was Christmas time again, but it was evening and the streets were lighted up. The ghost stopped at a certain warehouse door and asked if Scrooge, if he knew it. Know it? Was I apprenticed here? They went in. At the sight of an old gentleman in a Welsh wig, sitting behind such a high desk that if he had been two inches taller, he must have knocked his head against the ceiling, Scrooge cried in great excitement. Why, it's old Fezziwig. Bless his heart, it's Fezziwig alive again. Old Fezziwig laid down his pen and looked up at the clock, which pointed to the hour of seven. He rubbed his hands adjusted his capacious waistcoat, laughed all over himself from his shoes to his organ of benevolence, and called out in a comfortable, oily, rich, fat, jovial voice, Yo-ho there! Ebenezer! Dick! Scrooge's former self, grown a young man now, came briskly in, accompanied by his fellow apprentices. Dick Wilkins, to be sure. Bless me, yes, there he is. He was very much attached to me, was Dick. Poor Dick. Dear, dear. Yo ho, my boys. No more work tonight. Christmas Eve, Dick. Christmas, Ebenezer. Let's have the shutters up before a man can say Jack Robinson. You wouldn't believe how those two fellows went at it. They charged into the street with the shutters. One, two, three had him up in their places. Four, five, six, barred him and pinned him. Seven, eight, nine, and came back before you could have got to 12, panting like racehorses. Hilly-ho! Fezziwig skipped down from the high desk with a wonderful agility. Clear away, my lads, and let's have lots of room here. Hilly-ho, Dick. Cheer up, Ebenezer. Clear away? There was nothing they wouldn't have cleared away or couldn't have cleared away with old Fezziwig looking on. It was done in a minute. Every movable was packed off as if it were dismissed from public life forevermore. The floor was swept and watered. The lamps were trimmed. Fuel was heaped upon the fire and the warehouse was as snug and warm and dry and bright a ballroom as you would desire to see upon a winter's night. In came a fiddler with a music book 
and went up to the lofty desk and made an orchestra of it and tuned like fifty stomach aches. In came Mrs. Fezziwig, one vast substantial smile. In came the three Miss Fezziwigs, beaming and lovable. In came the six young followers whose hearts they broke. In came all the young men and women employed in the business. In came the housemaid, with her cousin, the baker. In came the cook, with her brother's particular friend, the milkman. In came the boy from over the way, who was suspected of not having bored enough from his master, trying to hide himself behind the girl from next door but one, who was proved to have had her ears pulled by her mistress. In they all came, one after another, some shyly, some boldly, some gracefully, some awkwardly, some pushing, some pulling. In they all came, anyhow and every how. Away they all went, twenty couple at once, hands half round and back again the other way, down the middle and up again, round and round in various stages of affectionate grouping. Old top couple always turning up in the wrong place. New top couple starting off again as soon as they got there. All top couples at last, and not a bottom one to help them. When this result was brought about, old Fezziwig, clapping his hands to stop the dance, cried out, Well done! And the fiddler plunged his hot face into a pot of porter especially provided for that purpose. But scorning rest, upon his reappearance, he instantly began again, though there were no dancers yet, as if the other fiddler had been carried home, exhausted, on a shutter, and he were a brand new man, resolved to beat him out of sight or perish. There were more dances, and there were forfeits, and more dances, and there was cake, and there was negus, and there was a great piece of cold roast, and there was a great piece of cold boiled, and there were mince pies and plenty of beer. But the great effect of the evening came after the roast and boiled, when the fiddler, an artful dog mind, the sort of man who knew his business better than you or I could have told him, struck up Sir Roger de Coverley. Then old Fezziwig stood out to dance with Mrs. Fezziwig, top couple too, with a good stiff piece of work cut out for them, three or four and twenty pair of partners, people who were not to be trifled with, people who would dance and had no notion of walking. But if there had been twice as many, four times, old Fezziwig would not have been a man. Old Fezziwig would have been a match for them, and so would Mrs. Fezziwig. As to her, she was worthy to be his partner in every sense of the term. If that's not high praise, tell me higher and I'll use it. A positive light appeared to issue from Fezziwig's calves. They shone in every part of the dance like moons. You couldn't have predicted at any given time what would have become of them next, and when old Fezziwig and Mrs. Fezziwig had gone all through the dance, advance and retire, both hands to your partner, bow and curtsy, bow and curtsy, corkscrew, thread the needle, and back again to your place, Fezziwig cut, cut so deftly that he appeared to wink with his legs and came upon his feet again without a stagger. When the clock struck eleven, the domestic ball broke up. Mr. and Mrs. Fezziwig took their stations, one on either side of the door, and shaking hands with every person individually as he or she went out, wished him or her a Merry Christmas. When everybody had retired and the two gentlemen, they did the same to them. And thus the cheerful voices died away and the lads were left to their beds, which were under a corner in the back shop. During the whole of this time, Scrooge had acted like a man out of his sorts. If his heart and soul were in the scene and with his former self, 
He corroborated everything, remembered everything, enjoyed everything, and underwent the strangest agitation. It was not until now, when the bright faces of his former self and Dick were turned from them, that he remembered the ghost and became conscious that it was looking full upon him while the light upon his head shone very clear. A small matter to make these silly folks so full of gratitude. Small? The spirit signed to him to listen to the two apprentices who were pouring out their hearts in praise of Fezziwig and when he had done so said, Why, is it not? He has spent but a few pounds of your mortal money, three or four perhaps. Is that so much that he deserves this praise? Scrooge felt much heated by this remark and began speaking unconsciously like his former, not his latter self. It isn't that, it isn't that spirit. He has the power to render us happy or unhappy, to make our service light or burdensome, a pleasure or a toil. Say that his power lies in words and looks, in things so slight and insignificant that it is impossible to add and count them up. What then? The happiness he gives is quite as great as if it cost a fortune. He felt the spirit's glance and stopped. What is the matter? Nothing particular. Something, I think. No. I should like to be able to say a word or two to my clerk just now, that's all. His former self turned down the lamps as he gave utterance to the wish, and Scrooge and the ghost again stood side by side in the open air. My time grows short. Quick! This was not addressed to Scrooge, or to anyone whom he could see, but it produced an immediate effect, for again Scrooge saw himself. He was older now, a man in the prime of life. His face had not the harsh and rigid lines of later years, but it had begun to wear the signs of care and avarice. There was an eager, greedy, restless motion in the eye, which showed the passion that had taken root and where the shadow of the growing tree would fall. He was not alone, but sat by the side of a fair young girl in a morning dress, in whose eyes there were tears, which sparkled in the light that shone out the ghost of Christmas past. It matters little, to you very little. Another idol has displaced me. And if it can cheer and comfort you in time to come, as I would have tried to do, I have no just cause to grieve. What idol has displaced you? A golden one. This is the even-handed dealing of the world. There is nothing on which it is so hard as poverty, and there is nothing it professes to condemn with such severity as the pursuit of wealth. You fear the world too much. All your other hopes have merged into the hope of being beyond the chance of its sordid reproach. I have seen your nobler aspirations fall off one by one until the master passion gain engrosses you. Have I not? What then? Even if I have grown so much wiser, what then? I am not changed towards you. She shook her head. Am I? Our contract is an old one. It was made when we were both poor and content to be so, until, in good season, we could improve our worldly fortune by our patient industry. You are changed. When it was made, you were another man. I was a boy. Your own feeling tells you that you were not what you are. I am. That which promised happiness when we were one in heart is fraught with misery now that we are two. How often and how keenly I have thought of this, I will not say. It is enough that I have thought of it and can release you. Have I ever sought release? In words, 
No, never. In what, then? In a changed nature, in an altered spirit, in another atmosphere of life, another hope as its great end, in everything that made my love of any worth or value in your sight. If this had never been between us, tell me, would you seek me out and try to win me now? Uh, no! He seemed to yield to the justice of this supposition in spite of himself. But he said with a struggle, You think not. I would gladly think otherwise if I could. Heaven knows. When I have learned a truth like this, I know how strong and irresistible it must be. But if you were free today, tomorrow, yesterday, can even I believe that you would choose a dowerless girl? You, who, in your very confidence with her, weigh everything by gain. Or, choosing her, if for a moment you were false enough to your one guiding principle to do so, do I not know that your repentance and regret would surely follow? I do, and I release you. With a full heart, for the love of him you once were. He was about to speak, but with her head turned from him, she resumed. You may, the very memory of what, pa what is past half makes me hope you will have pain in this. A very, very brief time, and you will dismiss the recollection of it, gladly as an unprofitable dream from which it happened well that you awoke. May you be happy in the life you have chosen. She left him, and they parted. Spirit, show me no more. Conduct me home. Why do you delight to torture me? One shadow more. No, no more. No more. I don't wish to see it. Show me no more. But the relentless ghost promised him, in, pressed him in both his arms, and forced him to observe what happened next. They were in another scene and place, a room not very large or handsome, but full of comfort. Near to the winter fire sat a beautiful young girl, so like that, that Scrooge believed it was the same, and until he saw her, now a comely matron sitting opposite her daughter. The noise in this room was perfectly tumultuous, for there were more children there than Scrooge in his agitated state of mind could count, and unlike the celebrated herd in the poem, they were not 40 children conducting themselves like one, but every child was conducted and conducting itself like 40. The consequences were uproarious beyond belief, but no one seemed to care. On the contrary, the mother and daughter laughed heartily and enjoyed it much, and the latter, soon beginning to mingle in the sports, got pillaged by the young brigands most ruthlessly. What would I not have given to be one of them Though I never could have been so rude, no, no, I wouldn't for the wealth of all the world have crushed the braided hair and torn it down. Oh, and for the precious little shoe, I wouldn't have plucked it off. God bless my soul to save my life as to measuring her waist in sport as they did, bold young brood. I couldn't have done it. I should have expected my arm to have grown round it for a punishment and never come straight again. And yet I should have clearly liked I own to have touched her lips, to have questioned her, that she might have opened them, to have looked upon the lashes of her downcast eyes and never raised a blush, to have let loose waves of hair, an inch of which would be a keepsake beyond price. In short, I should have liked it I do confess to have had the lightest license of a child and yet to have been man enough to know its value. 
But now a knocking at the door was heard, and such a rush immediately ensued that she, with laughing face and plundered dress, was borne towards it, the centre of a flushed and boisterous group, just in time to greet the father, who came home attended by a man laden with Christmas toys and presents. Then the shouting and the struggling and the onslaught that was made upon the defenceless porter, the scaling him with chairs for ladders to dive into his pockets, despoil him of brown paper parcels, hold on tight by his cravat, hug him round his neck, pommel his back and kick his legs in irrepressible affection. The shouts of wonder and delight with which the development of every package was received. The terrible announcement that the baby had been taken in the act of putting a doll's frying pan onto his mouth and was more than suspective of, of having swallowed a fictitious turkey glued on a wooden platter. The immense relief of finding this a false alarm the joy and gratitude and ecstasy. They are all indescribable alike. It is enough that by degrees the children and their emotions got out of the parlour and by one stair at a time up to the top of the house where they went to bed and so subsided. And now Scrooge looked on more attentively than ever when the master of the house, having his daughter leaning fondly on him, sat down with her and her mother at his own fireside. And when he thought that such another creature, quite as graceful and as full of promise, might have called him father, and been a springtime in the haggard winter of his life, his sight grew very dim indeed. The man turned to his wife with a smile. Belle, I saw an old friend of yours this afternoon. Who was it? Guess. How can I? <laughs> Don't I know. She added Mr. in the same breath, laughing as he laughed. Mr. Scrooge? Mr. Scrooge it was. I passed his office window, and as it was not shut up and he had a candle inside, I could scarcely help seeing him. His partner lies upon the point of death, and I hear, there he sat alone. Quite alone in the world, I do believe. Spirit, remove me from this place. I told you these were shadows of the things that have been. That they are what they are. Do not blame me. Remove me! I cannot bear it! He turned upon the ghost, and seeing that it looked upon him with a face in which, in some strange way, there were fragments of all the faces it had shown him, wrestled with it. Leave me! Take me back! Haunt me no longer! In the struggle, if that can be called a struggle in which the ghost, with no visible resistance on its own part, was undisturbed by any effort of its adversary, Scrooge observed that its light was burning high and bright, and dimly connecting that with its influence over him, he seized the extinguisher cap and by a sudden action pressed it down upon its head. The spirit dropped beneath it so that the extinguisher covered its whole form, but though Scrooge pressed it, Scrooge pressed it down with all his force, he could not hide the light which streamed from under it in an unbroken flood upon the ground. He was conscious of being exhausted and overcome by an irresistible drowsiness and further of being in his own bedroom. He gave the cap a parting squeeze in which his hand relaxed and had barely time to reel to bed before he sank into a heavy sleep. Millions of readers have admired Dickens' thoroughness in presenting the entire spectrum of memory. Scrooge maybe wouldn't admire it so much. The party at Fezziwig's, magnificent. The sting of regret over Bell, quite the opposite. 
and Scrooge still has two ghosts to come on his ghostly nightly program of self-discovery. Thank you for joining us for this part of Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, and please keep joining us part by part right up until Christmas Eve when we plan to conclude the story. Special thanks to our friend and contributor Dennis Daly in Australia for helping us to sort out these marvelous scripts. For now, I'm Adam Barr, and for Andrea Ems and our entire cast, I thank you.